All right, guys, welcome. Um, we've got most people here now, so a few more will be joining us later, and it looks like a few will be uh, watching the YouTube replay over the weekend. Uh, so thank you for joining me tonight. Um, this is a pretty exciting tasting, one I've really been looking forward to doing. Um, so tonight we're looking at the wines of Domaine Parent uh, from uh, Pommard uh, in Burgundy. And not only that, we're looking at two of the greatest vintages um, of recent times, 2015 and 2016, side by side. And it seems like it's uh, been that way um, many times over the decades in France where you've got back-to-back -back kind of brother and sister vintages like 15, 16, uh, 9 and 10, 95, 96, um, 89 and 90. Um, it's, it's been pretty common over the years to do that. And to, the opportunity to show these wines side by side is going to be pretty exciting. Um, neither of these are current release vintages for us. Um, these are both back vintages. Um, so some of these are some of the last bottles. Um, so I'm really looking forward to trying these side by side. Those of you who have done a few uh, Pinot or Burgundy tastings with me recently, I've um, certainly been probably very impressed by the quality of both the 15s and the 2016s that we've been looking at. Uh, so it's going to be really wonderful to look at them directly and to look at them directly from the same vineyards as well. Same producer, same vineyards um, across this different, um, the different terroir, um, looking at uh, the four different vineyards or the four top premier crew vineyards really that Domaine Perrant does. Um, so uh, I guess we should have a look first of all about where exactly we are um, in Burgundy. And we'll, uh, we'll bring this up so you can have a look. Mm -hmm. All right, give me a thumbs up if you can see that, uh, the Perrant label there. Hopefully you guys can all see that. Fantastic. All right, so this is where we're looking at here. So you've got your little inset map there of France, um, and you can see the two major areas um, uh, of Burgundy there. The main square on the map of France there uh, is the Côte d'Or, the, the Côte Chalonnet, the Maconnet there as well, and that little kind of um, uh, piece, little triangular piece up a little bit higher is Chablis. And Chablis is strictly part of Burgundy as well, but you'll notice that it's significantly higher than the rest of it. Uh, in fact, it's only just below Champagne. Um, so at Chablis there, if you go directly west from there, you're basically hitting Paris. So that's kind of the area that we're looking at. Uh, and Chab um, uh, Burgundy itself, you can see is very, very long. Um, so ranging right here from up here in Dijon um, in the north, uh, and Lyon is just down here in the south, just off the bottom of the page here. Um, but where most people think about when they think about uh, the top fine wines of Burgundy is, of course, the Cote d'Or, uh, this area in purple at the top here. And it literally means the golden slopes. Um, and that's because we're looking at one hillside, um, one embankment that runs all the way um, from here up to there, almost unbroken. Obviously, it's dipping into valleys and that as we go along there. And the Cote d'Or, the Golden Slopes, is really split up into two sections. Um, Cote de Bon and the Cote de Nuit. And where we're concentrating today is the Cote de Bon, which you can see here. So Bon is the largest city uh, in Burgundy, which we've got just there. And Pomar, the village that we're looking at, is just south of Bon. You can see it's the village immediately south, right next to Volnay. And really the villages of Pomar and Volnay are the two best villages um, in the Cote de Bon after Corton itself. And you can see Corton up here and the red of the Grand Cru. So the only red Grand Cru's um, in the Cote de Bone um, is the hill of Corton itself. You can see another little bit of Grand Cru down the bottom there. Uh, and those are the Grand Cru's of Poligny Monrochet and Chassane Monrochet. So those are white Grand Cru's down there. So um, uh, Le Monrochet itself, Chevalier, uh, Batard Monrochet, all down there. And so for, as far as the red wines go of the Cote de Bone, really the villages of Poma and Volnay um, are the two finest. And that is the village of Poma. Um, a pretty incredible photo that um, um, I was looking today for some photos that would really show us what the village looks like. Um, it's a pretty small village. There's about 600 inhabitants in the village. And as you can see, it's really almost a ship in a, a sea of vines. Uh, and you can see how undulating and hilly the Tawar is around the particular village itself, um, centered with the church in the middle there. And this is a village um, where the name itself um, uh, very much uh, goes into the mists of time. Um, the original name was probably at least a millennium old, at least a thousand years old, probably came from Pomeranian or, or Palmano. 
at the time and like much of Burgundy, um, all of this land that you can see there was originally belonged to either the Dukes of Burgundy um, or the church, um, depending on what time period we're looking at and uh, who had taken it from who at the time, especially after the French government seized it from most of the church. Um, and the main kind of uh, sections in here, the main chateau, like the Chateau Pomar, um, that was built in the 1800s. Um, you've got some other smaller chateaus in there, some very, very old vineyards, some very, very old clothes, some very, really old stone walls. Much of the vineyards that we're looking at here have been cultivated in exactly the same place uh, for at least 300 years, some of them going back five or 600 years uh, in the form and in the shape of the vineyard that we're looking at tonight as well. So um, it's a pretty special place. Now, there's a good map of Palma, so you can get an idea of what we're looking at there. And you can see the, uh, the vertical section of the village itself in the middle there, um, with the Premier Cruise situated on either side of the village in the main central part of the slope. And then you've got village wines below and village wines above um, in the higher sections as well. And as you can see, they're a little bit unusual for a village of such a claim um, that it has no Grand Cruz. And there is a few different reasons for that, but certainly when the um, Appalachian control system came in in 1936, um, the Appalachian system actually suggested uh, that two of the vineyards in Poma um, do get Grand Cru designation. And that was uh, Le Epineau, um, which hopefully you can see down here. Le Epineau, which is, consists of Grand Epineau and Petit Epineau down there. And also uh, Rougines. And Rougines is up in this section here. Uh, and at the time, though, the, uh, the farmers and the grape growers of Pomard weren't particularly concerned about their vineyards being classified Grand Cru. At the time, they were more concerned about all of the fake uh, pomade that was being sold out there in the world, a little bit like any generic white wine had Chablis put on it. Pomar was one of the villages that was very, very well known um, for having um, wine from other areas in the world uh, with the pomade name on it. Um, they also didn't particularly see the value um, in having any Grand Cru's in the villages, um, especially since they'd have to pay more tax on it. It was the same story we saw uh, with Domaine Marche and the Grand Rue, the reason why that never became Grand Cru. Uh, so no Grand Cru's in the village, um, though funnily enough, just in the last couple of years, uh, the 400 grape growers in the village have actually petitioned the French Appalachian system for both Rougine and Grand Epineau or L'Epineau itself to be finally upgraded to Grand Cru. Um, they're certainly the two, only the, the only two premier crews in the village that you would consider to be um, of Grand Cru quality if there was a reclassification today. Now, whether or not that's ever going to happen, um, that'll be a long and sordid process. Um, and I personally don't think it will get through. Um, the French are not known for making changes to their Appalachian system, uh, but good on them if they, if they want to try. <laughs> now there's another good shot of the, of the village itself looking down there. And the domain that we're looking at tonight, uh, Domain Perrant, um, or the Pront family has been in the village for a very, very long time. Um, at least uh, since the early 1600s, they believe, um, in the village itself. Um, there's another really, really great shot of it at night there and gives you an idea of just how cold um, and how snowy Burgundy is during the winter. Um, it's, it's much, much cooler than most of the um, grape growing regions that we have in New Zealand, including central Otago. That's another great shot of the village there, just showing the slope of the hills, that gentle slope leading down to the village. All right, now Perrant itself. Now the letter on the left there um, is a letter uh, written sometime around 1787 uh, by Etienne Perrant. And he had um, quite friendly and uh, professional connections with Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and they used to write to each other quite regularly. Uh, Thomas Jefferson came and visited um, during his famous trip to France. Uh, and Etienne Perrant, um, this was before Thomas Jefferson became the third president of the United States. Uh, Etienne Perrant became one of the forerunners of um, Burgundy exportation across the Atlantic, one of the first to, um, to export wines as a negotiant business to the United States. Um, and then at the uh, beginning of the 19th century, um, his son uh, Claude Perrant left the kind of the family home in Volnay 
uh, to finally settle uh, in Pomar where they'd been working these vines, uh, to finally settle there uh, and to build Domain Perrant uh, itself in 1803. So it was from 1803 onward that they uh, actually started um, making their own wines from the grapes rather than selling them on to various negotiants as well. Uh, on the right there, you can see Jacques Perrant. Um, I think he's about 19 or 20 in that photo there. So that's sometime around 1947, uh, or, sorry, um, 1947 to 1948. He, he started the company working with his father, Maxime. I can see there's a 1955 barrel he's working on there. Um, so that must be uh, 1956 or 1957. Um, that photo is taken there. And it looks like he's hand bottling um, or hand filling the bottles directly from the barrel. Um, and that's certainly a very, very old school way of doing it. Uh, now he took over the management of the domain in, in 1953 uh, and really triggered an innovative impetus. Um, they were one of the first estates, as you can see there, in the whole of the Cote d'Or uh, to start selling its entire production in bottles. Um, most people were still um, selling off a large majority of their production in barrels to other negotiants who would bottle it under various names and that at the time. And there you can see that's the original um, Perrant house. Um, and that, that was one of the very, very early buildings that were built there. And so they're now the 12th generation living there. You can see the, uh, the genealogical chart there all the way from Claude Perrant um, through Philippe, Jean-Baptiste, Johannes Maxime, Jacques Perrant himself, uh, and then Domaine Perrant uh, was created um, after Jacques Perrant uh, finally retired. So he passed on his domain in 1998. And when he passed on his domain, a little bit like the, uh, the classic French inheritance laws, it had to be split equally between his children. And he had three children. He had one son, Francois Perrant, who you can see over here on the left, and he had two daughters, Anne Perrant uh, and Catherine Farge Perrant. Uh, now, what happened was his son, Francois, um, was already married um, to um, Anne Francois Gros of the Gros family. And um, he, at the time when he was working with his father, was making a lot of the wines after his father started to slow down. But when he received his inheritance, he decided he was going to take that chunk of vineyards and he was going to merge it uh, into Domain and Francois Gros and work with his wife. So he took all of his parcels of vines and they came over here uh, to Domain AF Gros. Uh, and all of the remaining parcels uh, went to Anne and her sister Catherine. Um, so there's the two of them there. Um, so Anne on the left, um, she was born in 1958. Uh, there she is on the left. So she really began her career studying uh, private law at Dijon University, uh, but knew that she was eventually going to take over the family business. Um, so started doing a lot of her professional wine training at the time. Um, she did her um, agricultural uh, training, vocation training. She became a certificate expert taster, sensory analysis, uh, did her diplomas in enology, and gradually started to take over the strategic management of the domain, along with Catherine, who you can see on the right there. Uh, and she was the one who's been the driving force uh, really for the last 20 or so years behind the, uh, the viticulture and certainly the winemaking as well. Um, she's in charge of both of those, in charge of team management. Um, a very, very well-known woman in Burgundy, president of the Women and Wines of Burgundy Association, um, president of the National French Association of Women and Wine. Uh, she's a foreign advisor um, uh, to the French Trade Council. Uh, Chevalier of the Legion of Honor, of course, she's a Chevalier de Testvan as well. Um, so uh, a very, very well-established woman. Uh, Catherine, her younger sister on the right there, I think was born a couple of years later in 1960. And she really started her career, worked for a long time in the luxury hotel sector. Um, so when she came back to work at the Domain um, in 1998 to manage it with her sister, she's taken over um, all of the kind of uh, professional trade show, um, exporting, uh, marketing, all of that side of it. Mm -hmm. We've got Sophie just coming in. I've just let her into the waiting room. Hmm. All right. Okay, so I guess we need to move on to um, the first two wines. I'm not going to keep you too long before we um, start drinking. So hopefully um, you've got your wines all set out in your glasses already. So you've got four glasses in front of you there. Um, if you haven't done that already, 
um, you've got your eight different bottles and you'll see that they're labeled um, flight one, glass one, um, flight one, glass two, etc. And to make it even easier, you'll see on the bottles, it also has the, uh, the correct name of the, the wine itself. Um, so if you haven't done that yet, just get your first four glasses out and put in your first four wines there. So I'll just give you guys a second to do that. And we're going to be looking at wines one and two together. So tonight we're really going to be looking at these in, in pairs because I think that's the best way to do it. So um, what we'll do is I think we'll, we'll just taste these first two wines. Um, so glass one and glass two, let's all just have a taste of them um, before we talk about the vintages, before we talk about this particular vineyard, because it's nice to get a little bit of wine under our belt, I think, before we do that. So, uh, so let's start with glass one and two. Hmm. All right, two pretty wonderful wines to start with and uh, not surprising because uh, we don't have any simple wines tonight. You'll notice there's no Bourgogne, uh, there's no Village Pommard. Uh, we're starting at the Premier Cru level um, with uh, Le Chanlain uh, Premier Cru. 2015 in glass number one, 2016 in glass number two. So same wine producer, same vineyard, um, two back-to-back -back vintages here. So I guess to start with, before we talk about the vineyard itself, and we can go into a little bit more detail about the winemaking, um, let's talk about what we're looking at here with the vintages itself. Now, these are two extraordinary vintages, um, two certainly of the best in the last 25 years. Uh, and a little bit like uh, we saw in Bordeaux, um, 2015 came along and people thought, this is a vintage, we're not gonna see another vintage like this for another decade. Um, it was extraordinary. Uh, throughout the Cote d'Or. I mean, the red wines of this vintage are, are truly great. They're rich, they're powerful, uh, they're statuesque, you know, um, but they're underpinned by this juicy acidity as well. Um, and it's a warm year. Um, it's a very, very ripe year. Uh, but in general, there's no overripeness in the wines. We're not talking even as overripe perhaps as a 2009, and certainly nothing like a 2003. It's a very, very good vintage as well. Um, most vignerons, if they were wanting to compare 2015 to um, another vintage, would perhaps be uh, 2005, um, though uh, the yields were lower this year in 2015, uh, and I think the wines are more concentrated than 2005. 2005s also can be a little bit austere. I think the 15s are a little bit juicier, a little bit more charming than the, than the 2005s. Um, and I, I found a note here from um, uh, Michel Lafarge in Volnay, and he actually drew uh, parallels um, with the 1929 vintage, which he said was um, one of the first vintages he ever tasted as a young man in his father's cellar. And he said that he didn't actually think any other vintage in the last 60 years was comparable um, to 2015. Now, he said that before 2016 came along. And it's the same issue we saw in, uh, in Bordeaux. Such hype around 2015, such amazing wines. Uh, and the 2016s kind of slipped a little bit under the radar. People didn't really expect, um, they knew it was going to be a good vintage, but how could it be as good uh, as 2015? Well, certainly um, the harvest was a lot more difficult. 2015 was a, a very, very easy harvest. Um, if I'm looking at some of the notes here from, from Anne Perrant on 2015, um, she said that of all of the fruit that they brought in in 2015, uh, they sorted out just 0.05%. Um, that's less even than 2005. So that she said that is about as perfect a vintage as you could get. Um, and she said it was amazing, the energy and the generosity that the 2015s had. Um, also, she used quite a bit of whole cluster 
2015, which he hadn't done since 2009 and 2010. Um, so a wonderful, wonderful vintage. Um, she said the only really decision you had to make in 2015 was exactly what date you wanted to harvest. Um, there was just no problem with disease. There was no problem with um, weather pressure. The weather was perfect all through picking. Um, so, but she said, because you had that decision, there were some people who perhaps decided to leave the wines out a little bit too long. Uh, and you could probably flirt, flirt a little bit with overripeness and a little bit too high in alcohol. She said she wanted to be at 13% um, coming in rather than 14%. So she began reasonably early on the 5th of September, came in about um, seven days later. Uh, and the crop was about 40% down on 12, 13 and 14. Very, very difficult vintages. So, I mean, you could do no wrong in 2015 unless you really hung your fruit out for a very, very long time. 2016, on the other hand, certainly didn't look like it was going to be a great vintage at the start. Um, they had a pretty mild December uh, through February period, uh, and they were hoping for a, a pretty generous crop. They were hoping it was going to be very, very good indeed. Um, but uh, there was one particular night, the 26th of April, and it was the perfect storm. It was the most damaging frost they had seen in the Cote d'Or since 1981. Um, absolutely terrible. Um, we were talking about uh, minus five, minus six degrees in some of the vineyards. Um, obviously, depending on the topography, depended on how, how you went. Um, but we had people losing 90% of their crop in some vineyards. It was very, very difficult. Now, not only did they have some of the worst frosts <laughs> they'd seen in a very, very long time, um, they also suffered from some of the strongest mildew pressure uh, encountered in many, many years. Um, they had a brutally wet, consistently humid spring uh, and you also had these vines that were heavily weakened by the frost earlier in the season. Um, so people were spraying all the way May through July um, with not much margin for error. Some people sprayed up to 15 times um, until the soil started to dry out in July and you could actually get some machinery into some of these vineyards. You had people donning space suits and backpacks to do this work manually, especially in the lower kind of flatter vineyards. Um, and you had organic producers who were deciding that um, uh, after a succession of commercially difficult vintages, um, 11, 12, 13, 14, uh, they decided to give up their certifications um, in 2016. Uh, and they used commercial sprays just to stop their vines from deteriorating. So it was pretty difficult all the way through the start of the vintage, um, all the way through the middle of the vintage as well. It, it just wasn't looking good for 2016. Um, but then we had some superb weather come through, um, got warm, got dry at the end of June uh, with amazing conditions all the way through July, August and September with just the little right amount of rain as well. So you ended up in the situation where there wasn't much fruit set, um, hardly any crop in a lot of the vineyards. Um, and then you had this perfect growing weather. So it meant that the fruit that was left uh, was incredible. Um, and you had um, healthy skins all the way through to the end. Um, very little sorting of the fruit again, a little bit like 2015. Uh, and they didn't actually have to do um, all that much work in the sorting table because there was so little fruit that was actually coming in. There just wasn't much to, to harvest. Like I said, you had people somewhere between 40% and 90% down in production in 2016. Um, you had... Um, uh, some winemakers who just didn't have tanks that were big enough to vinify their wines. In some cases, people purchased special tanks or special barrels just for this purpose. People were canceling orders for barrels because they'd ordered too many barrels and there just wasn't enough fruit, there wasn't enough juice um, to go into all of these barrels. Um, so uh, very, very difficult all the way through, but then turned fantastic in the end. Um, and then you had wines that had great acidity great freshness, didn't have the richness and concentration of 2015, uh, but they're very, very elegant. And I think um, what you'll see as we go through this tasting, um, if you look at two great vintages like this in a different style, you've got the 2015s, which certainly in their youth um, were more about the vintage of 2015 than they were about the individual vineyards. The vintage character was so strong. It's one of those years where a lot of the vineyards certainly tasted quite similar early on. 
Um, and I think some of the classical Burgundy drinkers thought that the wines were perhaps verging on being too ripe. Um, but I certainly wouldn't say overripe. 2016, on the other hand, um, incredibly transparent. Um, the differentiation and the delineation in 2016 between different vineyards is really, really clear. So when you taste, this will be really interesting tonight because we're not even tasting different villages, we're just tasting different vineyards across the same village. And uh, the wines are described as um, kind of crystalline and transparent because you don't have that, that depth of fruit um, swamping them at the same time. Um, I also think that the, the 2015s perhaps have a little bit more density, perhaps a little bit more long-term structure to them, but the 16s are also gonna be very, very long-lived wines as well. Maybe the best 15s will outlive the 16s, um, but um, overall, um, the 16s have the balance and the depth to age gracefully. So it's gonna be really interesting to, um, to kind of compare the two of them um, together against each other. Okay, all right, let's have a look at the wines that we're looking at right now. Okay, Le Chonlin. So this first wine that we're, we're starting with now with the 2015 and 2016, this is from um, a Premier Cru vineyard. Um, it's about 4.43 hectares, so not particularly big, um, but of the Le Chanelin as well, there's also 5.96 hectares of it, which is village wine. Um, so there's two parts to it. So you can see the red part that's marked there is the Premier Cru part, and then the part above that you can see is not Premier Cru, it's only village. Uh, now it's pretty steep up the slope there, as you can see there. Um, quite a steep part of the slope, um, just above where we can see the cross there on the left is the steepest part of the slope. And the soil itself is made up of some very, very small stones. Uh, and it's a vineyard that has less clay than most. And clay is very, very important um, to, to Pomar. Um, you've got huge amounts of clay in most of the vineyards in Pomar. And it's, you've also got a really high percentage of active limestone in the village of Pomar and you get this reaction between the, the active limestone um, and the clay. Uh, and there's more of, of this than in Volnay and in Bone. And what you get is that's where you get this typical fullness and sturdiness uh, that differentiates the wines of Pomar. And certainly the, the wines of this village were known as wines that typically needed a lot of time to come around. Um, at least 10 years, sometimes up to 20 years in, in certain cases. So the wines being made today are a little bit more um, approachable than they were in the past. So you can see this is in the upper corner, just of the Premier Crew itself there. And there's another view looking out across the, the village itself. So very, very young vines um, for this Le Chanelin uh, of Perrant, um, only 15 years of age. Um, so I guess 15 years of age for the 2015, uh, 16 years of age for the 2016. Um, this one, maturation, when we looked at um, how they made them, um, she put a um, whole cluster into both of these wines, which she hadn't done since 2009 or 2010. So the 2015 is 40% whole cluster. Um, the uh, 2016 is around about 25% whole cluster. Uh, as far as the oak regime, 30% um, new oak in the 2015, 35% new oak um, in the 2016 and both of them 18 months in that wood as well. All right, any, uh, any thoughts on those first two wines? Certainly a, a very nice introduction um, and by far the youngest vine age we're going to be looking at tonight as well. I think they're really good um, representations of Pomar as well, yeah. Regan. And I think, you know, it's sort of two wines to start off with. I think they speak really well of that particular village, yeah. which, you know, to me is is all about the the power and the strength of those wines. And, 
you know, both these very, very different. And yeah, speaking to vintage, which is lovely to see. Um, but, you know, they also just are so typically Poma. Um, and yeah, I think you see that in it. Mm. Liz, how many times have you visited um, the domain and what can you tell us about Anne and Catherine? <laughs> um, yeah, every time I've been in Burgundy, um, I've been there um, since we've been bringing these wines in. I think um, your description of Anne before in terms of being very, very involved in the region is that, um, in fact, how I uh, got to meet her in the first place was she's actually really good friends with um, Anne Grow and also with uh, Chantal at Tortoise Show. Um, and, you know, three formidable women in terms of Burgundy, and it's, it's probably not um, any surprise that they work together. Um, the thing that I love um, about Anne, and actually I'll, I've got my notebook here, before you get to the next pair, I'll, I'll pull it out, but she's quite the poet, um, and, you know, her way with words is fantastic, and she likes to um, have an analogy for each of her wines, um, that usually relates to um, fast cars. Um, so I'll, I have that sitting there, I'll, I'll pull that out. But um, she sort of comes across as quite shy and quite timid and you wonder what you're gonna get. And then when she starts talking, um, you realize there's actually a really good sense of humor there. So she's very, very talented. I've got a car analogy as well. I wonder if it was the one that came from her. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll find it so we can compare and see if it's the same car. I think it's it's quite great though, because good though, because with Poma, you know, the the comment that I or word that I missed out on my description there is that they're quite masculine, and I you know I I don't particularly like that definition of you know these are are more masculine in style, and her way of getting around that is to use different types of cars. <laughs> All right. Okay, guys. Um, now we're going to look at glasses three and four. <laughs> and now we're looking at uh, La Aguil. Um, so in glass three, you've got the 2015. Um, and in glass four, you've got the 2016. So let's start by giving them both a taste. And then we can have a little bit of a talk. Wow, and you can see there already the big step up in quality we've got um, coming from Shanlin um, to Aguilera. And not a massive price difference between the two, um, both Premier Cru, um, but we've gone from um, a Premier Cru, uh, Le Shanlin is a, a reasonably kind of middleweight Premier Cru. Um, it doesn't have the kind of the, uh, that sumptuous mid palate uh, and the density that you see in the best pomades. Um, and these wines, you can see that mid palate weight is there that we didn't see before. Uh, now, as the uh, name suggests, if you know your uh, French, uh, it ref uh, the name actually refers to, to clay itself or, or the clay or the clay filled. Um, so very, very high clay content um, in this particular vineyard. Uh, and it's extremely well placed. Um, so you'll see this picture here just where it's situated, which is just here, and it's directly above uh, La Grande Epineau and Petit Epineau. So it's a very, very good position in the village as well. Um, now, it's funny enough, it's actually very, very rare uh, to find an example of this particular vineyard. There is not many out there. Um, it's not particularly large, uh, and there's not many producers who, who own um, uh, vines in here or 
produce them as its own premier crew. Um, a lot of the grapes from here seem to disappear off into other wines, uh, funnily enough, either into um, uh, Village Pomar uh, or into generic premier crew. Um, so this is one of the few. I was certainly was looking at um, Clive Coates' book on Burgundy. He'd only ever tried a few. Um, and I was looking at one of the more recent ones as well, um, who had never tried um, anything at all from this particular vineyard. So it is reasonably rare. Now the vines here um, are a little bit older. We're now looking at 21, 22 years old uh, for this particular vintage. Again, that clay limestone soils as well. 40% um, whole cluster in the 2015, only 10% whole cluster in the 2016. So there's a big difference there. Um, not such a big difference in the oak regime here though. 40% new oak in the 2015, 35% new oak um, in the 2016. Right, and now's probably a, um, a good time to, uh, to talk a little bit about um, the way that they make their wines there as well. Um, so we've heard, heard a little bit about it and you can see one of their horses here. Um, all of the plowing that they do in their vineyards is certainly um, very, very moderate. Um, no herbicides. Um, for some time, um, they've been orientated towards um, uh, a, certainly a biodynamic uh, and organic approach. They've been certified organic since 2013. I believe they're now certified biodynamic as of 2017 as well. Uh, now, um, lots of the work that they've always done in the vineyard has always been about um, sustainability as well. Um, hand harvesting, um, of course, all the way through there. Um, you can see some of that beautiful Pinot they're bringing in there, um, bringing it in, in those, those baskets as well. Um, they do their picking in the vineyard first, uh, and then do two different sets of sorting. So their first set of sorting is on a, uh, a vibrating table. Um, and then you've got a second through kind of a classical sorting table. And you've generally got eight different people looking at those grapes um, as they move through there. Uh, and traditionally, um, it's total destemming. And most of that destemming is done by hand as well uh, before they lead the berries to the vat. So it's not common uh, for her to use any whole cluster at all. Um, even though we're seeing whole cluster in both the 15 and the 16, um, there was no whole cluster in um, 2011, 2012, 2013, or 2014 as well. So it is a little bit, um, a little bit unusual. Um, all of the fermentations that they do, they're all um, natural fermentations with the indigenous yeasts out of the vineyard there. Uh, there's no inoculation at all. Uh, and that usually happens after kind of a few days of, of cold maceration as well. You can see there's the, uh, um, the barrels as well. Um, they do a little bit of pumping over, um, a little bit of punching of the cap to get that kind of sweet extraction out of the wine as well. Um, but I think at Perot, they certainly favor the, the balance between um, power, uh, finesse, and elegance. Um, I certainly wouldn't call them one of the, the heavier uh, or the gruntier styles of pomadas. There are some producers out there still making that very old school style. Um, I think if you had to compare pomade to a village in the Cote de Nuit, it would probably be Gervais Chambertin. You know, it's pretty sturdy. Uh, it's pretty robust. In fact, probably a little bit more so. Um, in Pomard, um, but I think the wines in Pomard um, are very much at the elegant end of the scale as far as Pomard goes. Uh, and I think you see that in both of those two wines as well. Um, now the barrels that they've got there, of course, all French oak. Um, new oak sits somewhere between 20% for the kind of the village kind of wines, um, up to about 40%, maybe 45% maximum for the Premier Cruz. Uh, and then you're 80 to 100% um, new oak for the Grand Cru's like the Corton. Uh, unfortunately, we don't get any of their Grand Cru's um, here in New Zealand. Um, so we're, we're not able to try those tonight. Um, when they do their blending, um, they do all the blending by cuvee um, in stainless steel vats. Um, generally, there's no filtration either. And of course, all their bottling is done by the biodynamic principles. So it's all done by the lunar calendar. You know, um, they want it to be a fruit day. They want it to be a downward moon, pulling that energy um, from the sky down into the wines when they bottle as well. <laughs> Sorry, Regan, just on um, the uh, use of whole bunch. Um, it yeah. was actually just interesting. 2015 is actually 
um, the first year that Anne, as you said, the first that we've seen, but it's actually the first year that she added a whole bunch. And okay. I actually asked her why. Why make that decision now? And I was interested, was it fad tradition? Yeah. You know, what was she actually following? And she just simply said that the stems looked really well matured. Um, and the percentage of a stem to the grape was right for her and that she hadn't seen that before. Um, so she added them in 2015 and then she really liked what it did. <laughs> so that's why you then see it um, sort of going forward. Um, the other thing, um, 2010 was when they started um, converting to biodynamic. Um, they've actually been organic since um, 2009 certified organic 2013 certified biodynamic in 2017 um and the other sort of interesting thing there is actually in terms of the use of sulfur um so they actually don't use any sulfur until after the malolactic so it's all native yeast but the yeast in the winery is strong enough to go through alcoholic and then malolactic by itself um, and then they will add a little bit of sulfur at the end. So, you know, instead of anyone out there talking about natural wine, um, this is pretty natural. It's not, not a lot that would um, move you from the definition of natural when it comes to this one. Now, there you go, you've had time to enjoy them, Regan. I have, yeah. Um, <laughs> those are fabulous and like a, a really big step up, I think, from the Chandelier. I've got some some good notes from her on on the vintages as well. I think um, 2015, she basically says I've almost got nothing to say apart from the fact they lost about 40% of the crop as the vines hadn't really recovered their potential after all the hail, of course, that they had over the preceding um, uh, three years. But she said the um, the quality was sublime, um, even wow. Um, she said here um, on 2015 that the wines have a presence and a life as you will, that is really seen and makes them wonderfully satisfying. Um, I've never seen a cleaner vintage. Even 2005, which was close, wasn't quite as clean. Um, and I think there's another note here, which was talking about the 2015s that she said the winemaking itself on 2015 was easy. Um, I just didn't want to bottle them too quickly. Um, it's a very yum, yum vintage, is how she described it. <laughs> Uh, Regan, yes. it's Mike here. Um, hey, Mike. A, a very simple question. What's the benefit of whole bunch? You know, I, I'm, I'm a bit of an ignoramus here, but what's the benefit? Well, why did the winemaker look for that? Yep. Um, so one of the things, if you're putting in a whole bunch, um, you're not just putting in fruit, of course, because you're putting in the entire bunch. So you've got all of the stalks, all of the stems in there as well. Um, as opposed to just putting fruit in. So if you're putting all of the stalks and all of the stems in there as well, you're going to get a lot more tannin and a lot more structure to the wine than if you're just putting in fruit. Now, of course, you need to be very careful about putting in a whole bunch and how much you put in, because you need to make sure that those stalks and those stems are fully physiologically ripe. Because if they're not fully ripe, um, you're gonna start adding some green flavors and herbaceous flavors um, into your wine as well. Um, which is usually undesirable. It depends what you're actually going for there. So um, you need to make sure that those are ripe, that those are brown enough, um, and what kind of percentage you're going to put in, depending on how ripe that vintage is, and whether or not the vintage needs it, whether or not the vintage needs more structure, whether you want more structure to balance out with your fruit or not, or whether the style of wine that you're making doesn't suit that. So it's very much a winemaking decision. Thank you. Liz, do you have anything to add to that as well? Yeah, I was going to say, it's a really good question, Mike, and um, any questions, go for it, because there's, there's not a stupid one. Um, I would just add that why I reference, you know, is it fad, is we, we hear a lot of winemakers talking about whole bunch, and I think it has become sort of the trendy topic of conversation. What I like with Anne is she had a really good reason for doing it. You know, she saw something that she liked, in those stems and she gave it a go. Um, the other thing is when you imagine a fermentation with a whole lot of um, berries bobbing about and then a whole lot of berries bobbing about with some stalks in there, you actually get a very different structure to the, the fermentation, to the actual liquid. Um, and when you get stalks in there, there's, 
you know, some school of thought that actually you get different fermentation temperatures um, and that it is one way to um, sort of control uh, alcohol and the resulting of alcohol in your fermentation. So it can affect um, the extraction um, because obviously a higher temperature, you're gonna have a, a more extract than there. And it can actually produce wines that have a slightly lower alcohol. Um, it's a little bit contentious, that, that sort of side of it, but you know, those are some of the schools of thought as well as to why you do it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I see a note here saying that in, in 2015, she said that both the seeds of the grapes and the stems themselves were brown. So they were very ripe. She said she knew that they had good phenolic ripeness um, in those stems as well as really, really good sugar ripeness in the grapes or really because you had to because those were so ripe as well. Uh, now with the 2016 vintage, um, she said that um, 2016 was also extremely yum, uh, but they lost 65% of the fruit um, in 2016. Um, their largest losses were more in the generic um, appellations, like they lost... Um, 70% uh, of their bone premier crews. Uh, they lost 90% um, of their kind of regional wines. Um, but it wasn't so bad uh, in Pomar. I think it was more like only about 15% in Pomar. They managed to avoid a lot of the, um, the really, really worst frosts. Uh, but she said, of course, it's the seventh consecutive vintage that that had uh, with such low um, a quantity. And she said, without the frost, it would have been a big crop. It was looking like it was going to be a big crop. Um, but their cellars um, uh, were looking pretty empty at the time. Uh, and they managed to, to just stay organic um, throughout the entire vintage, except for I think there was two regional vineyards where they had mildew. Uh, but in the end, the frost took 90% of those vineyards anyway, so it wasn't a big issue. Here comes the cat. We'll see if he can stay off the keyboard. <laughs> Benji's come to say hello. That's the first time he's actually managed to get himself on camera in one of these. He usually lies down um, next to him here. Um, so yeah, 16 was, was pretty difficult for her as well. She also said um, uh, that uh, they did 13 or 14 um, different treatments um, during the rainy period uh, for the biodynamic vines. They just had to. They were under such mildew pressure that year. Uh, and she said it, it was a huge challenge, but when she sees the results, she doesn't have any regrets of sticking with biodynamics through this vineyard, uh, this vintage where some people found it very, very difficult and, and pulled the pin on it. Um, she didn't think that the mildew was that bad compared to some other producers. It was more on the leaves than it was on the, on the grapes, um, but it was a hard job. She said you had to keep aerating the foliage, had to keep moving it around, make sure air was circulating in the vineyard, um, prune everything back. Um, and she didn't want to wait too long when she did the harvest. She thought the maturity was already there kind of at the end of September. She thought the acidity was there. Um, so they're tasting the grapes. They can see what that fruit ripeness is like, see what the acidity is like. Um, yeah, she said in Pomard, they only lost about five to 15% because the last three weeks of the vintage were just um, so special. And she said, yeah, less whole cluster in 2016 than 2015. Um, she said with the exception of Corton Grand Cru and the Epino, which were, were pretty close to the same amount she did in, in 2015. Uh, she said she actually lost more with the frost in 16 than they did with the hail in 12, 13 and 14. And the hail was terrible. So, I mean, it's been a tough time um, for them. All right, um, four more wines to go. So I'll give you guys um, a couple of minutes. We can have a little break here. If you need to go to the bathroom, get your four glasses set up uh, with your four wines for flight number two, and we'll start back again in about two minutes. Mm.
All right, guys, we've got most people back. <laughs> Correct, Liz, they are. <laughs> All right, guys, okay, our next flight. <laughs> All right, and now we've got a huge step up um, in Vine age here. Uh, we've gone from 15 years of age um, up to 21 years of age, and now we're having um, Domain Perron, uh, 2015, 2016, uh, their premier crew, Le Chaponier. Uh, and now we're looking at 78 year old vines um, in these particular wines here. Um, the age of their vines ranges, ranges somewhere between around about 61, 62 and 78 in this vineyard, so extremely old. Um, so let's take a minute to try the 2015 and 2016. Mm -hmm. Wow, a couple of beautiful wines there. Uh, and you can see here, now we're really in the heart of the village here. Uh, so Le Chaponier is on the southern side of the village. So you've got, if we're looking at this map here, the northern side of the village uh, facing towards Bone is on the right-hand side. The southern side of the village, um, heading down towards Merceau, uh, is on the left-hand side. Now, I think um, uh, we were talking about uh, an analogy before Liz about fast cars and I've got one here where um, uh, somebody described and it may have been on Perrant herself given what you said that the northern side of, um, of Pomar certainly where say uh, Epino is is more like a golfer who drives an Aston Martin uh, and the southern side of the village is like a rugby player who drives a Porsche <laughs> so I don't know if that's the same one but uh, I quite like that uh, that analogy yes so we're looking at the at the, the richer, you know, um, you know, more solid side of the village here in the south. Yeah, those are Anne's comments. Those are Anne's, okay. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. I, I found them written in my notebook and I, and I didn't have them written down as who they were referenced by. <laughs> yeah. Right, so you can see here, um, uh, Le Chaponier uh, on the southern side, um, they think that the name uh, for this originally came from uh, the word Chapon, which means uh, new vines ready for planting. Uh, and this is an excellent um, site. Um, so we talked about uh, Le Rougine um, being the, one of the top um, vineyards in the village and certainly out of the two that you would look at for uh, escalation to Grand Cru status out of Rougine and Epineau, uh, Rougine is generally considered to be the better of the two. Uh, and you can see Le Chaponier uh, is right up hard against Rougine as well, up against the side of the village there. So it's an excellent position. Uh, now the basic difference if we wanted to talk about, because we're not tasting unfortunately Rougine tonight. Uh, and the reason for that is that we don't have um, both vintages of Rougine left. It's usually the first to sell um, because it's so desirable. Um, but if we wanted to look at the difference between say uh, Rougine and Epineau, which we are tasting tonight, um, is that uh, Rougines has 
uh, a sheer power to it as well to go with the um, the size and the richness. Um, whereas Epino is a little bit more laid back and a little bit more elegant. Um, and that's perhaps that um, that golfing Aston Martin uh, analogy on the northern side of the vintage. Whereas Rougine, uh, more that rugby player who drives a Porsche, a little bit more power, a little bit more, more richness, a little bit more size as well. There's a really good view looking down into the uh, the village as well. So we're looking at 75, uh, 78 year old vines um, in the 2016 here. Uh, the 2015 is 50% um, whole bunch, whole cluster in that wine. 50% uh, whole cluster with 55% new oak. So that's significantly more than we've seen uh, before as we've gone through here. Uh, now the 2016, um, a massive drop in the whole cluster she put in here, only 10% in the 2016 and the new oak's been dialed down to 37%. Um, so it is a little bit lower um, in that one. All right, I, um, I love these two, these two wines and you can see that, that density and that size, that mid palate weight uh, that Pomard's really known for here. But also I think both of these wines, despite being really large scale, um, still show that finesse and elegance that Domaine Perrault is known for. Mm -hmm. Love the nose on these two as well. Interestingly enough, I tried a few um, different glasses tonight. So I've got some holding glasses, but then the glasses um, uh, that I'm actually drinking out of tonight um, are the New World um, Pinot Noir, very, very similar to the Central Otago Pinot Noir glass. Now I... Um, I uh, actually thought it was best out of the uh, the old school Venom Pinot Noir glass, uh, but I didn't have two of them here, uh, and I wanted to make sure I compared them side by side. So I um, I also tried them out of the the Venom Extreme uh, and another one as well. Uh, but certainly the Venom Extreme tended to um, emphasise the structure of the wine uh, to the detriment of the fruit. Um, you lost a little bit of the sweetness of the fruit. Um, a little bit of the aromatic complexity. Uh, it darkened it up and it made it quite a bit more tannic as well, which would be good for certain wines. But I thought for these, uh, it was much more open, much more expressive um, in this particular glass. Um, so don't ever let anybody tell you that glass doesn't make a difference because um, it makes a huge difference. Um, I mean, I've had tried it out of four different glasses tonight and these wines taste different out of every single glass. So it does depend what you're trying them out of. Um, as to exactly uh, what you'll get, but I'm guessing we'll all see the same relative differences um, between vintages here. Mm. Liz, what did you think of um, of these two with that much older vine age? Mm. Yeah, I think it's, um, I mean, again, it's another step up and it's sort of, I like the order that you've got the wines in um, tonight for sure. Um, I think it's, you know, certainly really expressive. I, I love the sort of natural balance to the wine. You know, they're generous, but there's a there's an impressive balance there. Um, interesting with this um, uh, vineyard, there's actually only four owners of this Premier Cru. Um, and okay. it's one that Anne particularly likes. And she actually has replanted it, um, a large part of it, um, two years ago. And um, the part that she's replanted um, she uh, doesn't use it um, in the final wine. So for quite a few years going forward, there's actually going to be less of this because um, she'll just declassify that because the vine age here, I think, to her gives it a lot of what its character is. Um, so she doesn't want to um, add that back into it. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. The other thing is... Um, in terms of when she planted it, um, you know, what did, what did she plant it with? Um, and it is um, massive selection through that um, vineyard. So she's used the clones that are in that vineyard and created, um, uh, propagated new vines to go back in. So it's the same clonal material um, that was in the vineyard that will go back in, um, because I think that's obviously very important as well. Mm. Mm. No, I don't know um, 
what other people are seeing out there, but certainly in some of the other tastings we've done recently where we've tried, say 2015 and 2016 side by side, um, I've generally had a, a pretty clear preference myself for the 2016s. Uh, but in this lineup so far, I'm finding it really difficult to choose between them. Um, both of both vintages are exceptional from Perrant. Um, yes, it's a little bit more crystalline. It's a little bit more pure in the 16s, a little bit more focused. Um, but the 15s are in no way um, overripe or or swamping the identity of the vineyard with the fruit um, at all. Um, like they're extremely restrained for 15s, I think. Mm. Yeah, I think, Stephen, the 2015s, uh, I can see why you're leaning towards them. They're just so delicious, you know? <laughs> they, they're, yeah, I'm struggling to tip those ones out. I've got my spittoon here, but it's, it's not working on the 15s at all. <laughs> yeah, I agree, Stephen. This is, these are some of my favorite 15s that I've tried recently. I think 15 was a vintage as well that a lot of winemakers thought was going to be one of those vintages that was just going to drink well all the way through and was never going to close down. Um, but from a lot of producers, um, the 15s have started to kind of go into themselves a little bit now, and they're not so expressive as they were before. Uh, and who knows how long that's going to last. Um, but certainly tonight, I think these are, these are still really showing really, really well, um, even though it's clear that they've got, you know, a massive time in front of them, probably, you know, um, 10, 15 years, you know, somewhere in that kind of range. Mm. Mm. With the 15s, Regan, this is Mike here, would the yeah, 15s uh, by and large have a lower alcohol than the 16s? I, I'm seeing to get a difference there in tannins. Yeah, no, the 15s actually have higher alcohols in general oh, right. than the okay. 16s. Um, not by much. We're talking, you know, it probably wouldn't even be one degree on average. It would probably be under half a degree. Um, what do you think, Liz? Like... Yeah, under half a degree difference, but the 15s are definitely a riper. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's, there's very little difference um, in it, um, for sure. But yeah, the 15s, just that ripeness, will have produced a little bit more alcohol. But I think why you're not seeing it in the 15s is the fruit is so beautiful. Yeah. The acidity is so brilliant. And just, you know, they're, they're silky and velvet and... You know, they've got a taut structure to them, still very distinctively pomar. You know, they're still the structure of pomar. Um, but there's a real purity to them. And when you get all those things together, can probably carry a little bit more alcohol. Whereas, you know, 16, that was a, I mean, they've done so well. These are great wines, but that was a challenging vintage. <laughs> um, and, you know, when you, you're working really hard to make the wine, sometimes alcohol can be perceived a little bit higher than it is, which is why I think when you're looking at them tonight, they're looking the other way around to perhaps what they are, but it's very, very small differences. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. Perfect. All right, um, just two wines to go. Uh, and we're looking at uh, Le Epino itself. Uh, now, just uh, I guess before we try this, um, we remember that there was two parts to, um, to Epineau, Grand Epineau and Petit Epineau. And the nice thing about um, this wine is that um, she happens to own uh, vines in both portions. Um, so this is exactly 50% Petit Epineau and exactly 50% Grand Epineau. All right, so let's, uh, let's give them both a try and then we'll have a talk about them.
Now the vine age that we're looking at here isn't quite as old um, as what we were tasting before. We were looking at some very old wines in, in Le Chaponier. And of course we were looking at the southern side of the village. Now we're on the northern side of the village. Uh, and uh, her vines in uh, Petit Epineau, um, average age of uh, 53 years. So they're still extremely old. That's taking down on the village itself. Uh, and then uh, her vines uh, in Grand Epineau um, are a little bit younger. Uh, they average about 28 years of age. So we can see the two sections there of Le Grand Epineau uh, and the particular section of Petit Epineau that she has her vines in, which is the upper section, uh, not the lower section. Now, um, the name itself of, of Epineau, they think it was um, derived from uh, uh, the word Epineau, uh, E-A-U. And that was a, a very, very old term for um, a really spiny, spiky bush uh, that they think covered this entire hillside long before vines were planted. So you can see how um, over, over really a millennia, uh, the name has, has been retained, even though um, the bushes are long gone and the, and the grapes are there. Uh, now it's a reasonably gentle slope that we're looking at here. It's um, nowhere near as steep as the southern side of the village, uh, but there's lots of pebbles in the soil. And with all of these pebbles in the soil, this really contributes to some very, very good drainage um, across both um, uh, areas here. And the pebbles also contribute to the elegance of Epineau, um, generally once the tannins have softened. Um, so we're looking at a wine that really here is probably one of the Grand Cru's of the village. Uh, and you can see how these uh, vine, wines are still particularly young, um, but certainly the more elegant side of the village. Now, the, if you look at what's better between Grand Epineau and Petit Epineau, uh, well, this is nice because we're tasting 50% of both. So it's pretty hard for us to make a call on that. But if you look at all of the older books on Burgundy, um, they all seem to favor Grand Epineau uh, as the best of the two. Uh, but the more modern view on it um, seems to be that, um, that uh, Petit Epineau is the better section of the two. So a um, little, bit, little bit hard to make a call there particular. Certainly the name uh, Grand and Petit um, has, has nothing to do with, um, with kind of the, uh, the size. If you look at the two sections of Petit Epineau, if you add those together, they're larger than Grand Epineau. So it's not that they think that it was called Grand Epineau because of the length of the rows. And you can see how long uh, the section of the rows could be through there as well. So they think that's where the uh, original name came from. Now, um, out of the two sections of it, as you move um, from, from this end, from the northern end towards Bone, back towards the village, uh, you get more alluvial soils down this end, closer to the village where Grand Epineau is. Um, so Grand Epineau tends to be a little bit sturdier, um, a little bit more four square uh, than Petit Epineau, which is a little bit prettier as far as that goes. Um, now of the two wines here, the 2015, 50% um, uh, whole cluster uh, in the 2015 and 50% new oak. The 2016, 30% whole cluster and 40% new oak. So we're seeing the, the kind of the same thing that we saw um, through the other one. Oh, Peter's coming back in again. But yeah, similar across the two. So in general, um, across all the wines, we saw a little bit um, more whole cluster in the 15s and a little bit new oak, a little bit less of both um, in the 2016s. And you can see um, how she really adjusts depending on vintage. I think that's a reasonably tough call uh, between the last two wines and those two wines um, as to really what was better. You can see um, Le Epino was priced a little bit, a little bit higher. I think they're about 225 retail versus uh, 199 on the um, uh, Chaponier. Uh, but really both very, very good vineyards. A, a lot of that is to do with the, um, certainly the prestige of Epino, but tasting those, I certainly wouldn't disagree with, with people who preferred um, uh, Chaponier. Um, stylistically, a little bit different on the northern side of the village to the to the southern side of the village. Mm. Yeah, and absolutely agree, Stephen. Like the 2015s, like heaps of oak, um, heaps a whole bunch, and no, it doesn't show um, at all. Like, like that fruit just sucks it up. Mm. 
And I have to say, I don't know if it's the same for you guys um, in these glasses, but I've certainly found across the entire night, I've found on the nose, the 15's much more expressive than the 16's. The 16's for me in these glasses um, have been a little bit more closed on the nose. For sure, the 15's have really been lifted, which I didn't actually expect because um, most of the 15's I've had recently have been, have been a little bit, like they've been shutting down. They haven't been as good as they have been over the last couple of years because they were delicious on release. Very, very good. Um, but yeah, just not tasting so good the last few years. But tonight, the 15s have been fantastic. Mm -hmm. mm. I see, see some chat out there about, uh, about favorite wines. Um, anyone want to want to comment on the wines at all? Uh, maybe vintage or maybe favorite vineyard? Hmm. I reckon just on the Epino, um, you know, when it, every time I taste Epino, there's some sort of words that um, come to it that I think these are, are definitely showing tonight. And, you know, we talk about pomade being big in the structure, but this is full throttle pomade. Mm. You know, these, these are, are bold, they need time, you know, they've got all this power. And then there's this, particularly with the 15, there's this red fruit on the finish. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, it's super attractive. Um, interesting also with that um, 15, I talk about the effect of um, the hail on yield. Normally uh, she makes, uh, what is it, 6,000 bottles of this. So it's still 6,000 bottles when you can think of sort of a global market, it's tiny. In this particular vintage, she made 3,000. Hmm. Wow. So it doesn't keep the bank manager very happy. Mm. Yeah, Stephen, I agree that the 16s are much deeper. They're sort of almost like the 15s, I think, have a red, more of a red fruit character to them. And the 16s, more of a, a black fruit with red playing a, a sort of secondary um, fiddle to it, for sure. Mm. Mm. I've got some good notes here from, um, Neil. well, you would have seen, I think I put Neil Martin's notes in the, in the brochure there, but I'm um, looking at some of his... Um, Tasty notes from visiting there. <laughs> she actually describes um, uh, my visit to Amparant, whose domain sits in the shadow of the church in central Pomar. And you can see the, that church in a lot of the pictures there is always one of my favorites. An early morning rendezvous with Auntie Han is a great way to start the day. I've been following her wines for almost two decades now, and I feel like they have markedly improved in the last four to five vintages, perhaps due to biodynamics in the vineyard perhaps just a little more prudence in the winery. Um, in the past, I occasionally found some of the cuvées over-oaked. However, the wood now seems more sympathetic with the fruit. And certainly, I mean, there's nothing here that you would describe as even remotely over-oaked, um, which is really, really interesting to see. Uh, he, he thought that when he visited and tasted the 2015s, that it was the best set of wines he'd um, ever tasted from Amperant, with maybe a lighter kind of touch than previous vintages. And consequently more precision. Um, and he actually apologized for the uniformity of scores across all of her different pomades. Uh, as he said, they were all so good, I'd recommend any of them. Um, so that was interesting. And then in 2016, he said another extremely strong set of wines from Amperant, uh, a winemaker who I might suggest is severely underrated uh, by Burgundy connoisseurs, one of her strongest portfolios yet. Uh, in particular, in reference to her Pomard Premier Cruise. Um, so uh, he thought that, the, in general, if you look at his scores, though he scored the 15s a little bit higher than the 16s. Um, and for most producers, um, it's generally pretty close or sometimes the other way around. Um, so to be honest, tonight, um, um, I wouldn't disagree with him on the 15s. This is the strongest set of 15s I've tasted recently. Very, very good wines. Um, I almost always prefer the 16s from most producers, but I have to say tonight, I, I love the 15s. They're just, they're so generous. They're so expressive. Um, like Amparant said, they're so yum, you know, it's, it's hard to resist them. Yeah, Regan, I actually asked Anne, what does she think is the difference for her in the wines uh, from her conversion to biodynamics? Um, mm. And she said for her, she said, the wines feel alive. They feel more vibrant. Um, and she said, just in general, the soil and the vineyards are healthier. 
um, and that you know working in them you can feel it um, so yeah and she's not a you know if you put her in the same room as James Milton <laughs> you know they're, they're not <laughs> they're polar opposites yeah, even like, though they're both working with biodynamics, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, James would, you know, wax lyrical all night about it. Um, but Anne, you know, she sort of shuffled about and was a little bit uncomfortable with my question, but similar sort of answer to it. <laughs> yeah, one says colours, one says cars. Yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> they probably have very different dreams. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Right. Oh, wonderful, guys. Well, um, this has been a real pleasure to um, to taste this. I mean, this is a, a lineup I've been I've been wanting to put together. Oh, Stephen, a root day, interesting. I hadn't checked that actually because you would have suspected it was a, a leaf for a fruit day, given how well the wines are showing. Um, so that that is quite interesting. Uh, but I think with these wines, um, Domaine Perron just isn't particularly well known, and people don't realise how good these wines are. Um, so I thought, I mean, we've got some more recent vintages from them. We've obviously got 17. There's some older vintages out there as well. I think there's some 14s, some 13s, some 12s. There's the, there might be the odd bottle of 2010 as well. But I thought the best way to present these to you guys was to look at two great vintages, um, which really express the vineyards, um, and look at four premier crews together uh, and show how a winemaker, even in a great vintage like this, can really express that differences between the vintages and the vineyards as well, which is really, really nice to see. Um, so if you guys wanna refollow anything um, uh, from this tasting, um, tomorrow we'll send you out an email which will have a link um, to the full tasting that you can rewatch on YouTube. Um, sometimes it's good to just skip to the bits that you wanna get more information from. And we'll also put in a special offer for you guys on the wines tonight. Um, so if you do want um, any of these wines, um, don't order it right now, um, or if you do order it right now, send me the order number, um, and then I will make sure that you get the special offer on those. So there'll be a, a voucher code or something for you guys tomorrow on these um, with some really, really good pricing on them. So um, thank you very much for joining us tonight. This has been a, a fantastic tasting to host. I've really enjoyed selecting these wines, putting this tasting together, and of course, um, drinking them. So hopefully you guys have enjoyed drinking them too. Oh, hey, um, David, um, answer to your question I see there. Yes, we will be continuing the virtual tastings, even though um, Auckland is moving into level one. Um, we definitely recognise um, the benefit of these for our customers around the country in particular, um, but also they're very convenient for our Auckland customers and, you know, God knows getting across Auckland, um, particularly if you live on one side of the bridge or the other, um, is not always that easy. Um, so yeah, we'll definitely be continuing them and actually um, there's some great virtual tastings coming up. So um, did you want to run through those, Regan, or do you want me to quickly? Yeah, yeah, you can quickly run through those. Mm. Um, so there's a Taylor's Port tasting coming up. Oh yes, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. yeah, we've got three vintages of Taylor's Port that have all been rated um, 100 points, which is exciting. And that'll be presented by the team um, at Taylor's from Portugal. Um, we've also got a rosé tasting coming up and if you're not into rosé, I uh, still suggest you join this one because we've got um, the team from Chateau Mascaron, Chateau Lyob and Chateau Poege, um, so from France, so three French producers and then five um, New Zealand rosé producers and I think it'll be really interesting to hear them all talk about rosé um, and the wines that we've chosen are, are particularly good. Um, and then, of course, this Saturday, for those who are in Auckland, yay, we can do something in person. We're quite excited. Finally. Uh, <laughs> yeah, finally. <laughs> we can say hello to everyone. Um, but, um, yeah, we'll be doing a Bordeaux walk around tasting and um, the 17s. Again, if you're sitting there thinking, nah, I'm into Pinot or I'm into Merlot and I don't, don't drink Cabernet-based wines, um, then you need to come taste the 17s because the 17s from Bordeaux are delicious. Um, so yeah, that's just a little snapshot. Um, lastly, Malt Whiskey, we have Matt Thompson releasing um, a new uh, barrel um, aged whiskey. And I think that's coming up from memory next week. And it'll be a product that hasn't been seen on the market yet. And he's going to do that at Victoria Park with um, Jack. So yeah, there's something for everyone. It's especially nice to see um, some of you Wellington 
uh, guys at a tasting because we send wine down to you all the time. We know you go and visit um, Sophie and Francis uh, and Meredith who are, who are all in on this tasting tonight down there. And um, it's nice for you guys to be able to join us with the tasting up here as well. Um, so yeah, we're definitely going to continue with these. Go. Awesome. Thanks guys. Have a great evening. Very good. Thanks.